boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos. Um, eu vou só dizer algumas palavras de introdução, vou fazer em português, depois passo a palavra para o Alex Ayur, já que vai falar em inglês, de qualquer das formas, uh, na parte do debate, um, quem uh, quiser colocar questões, fazer intervenções em inglês, uh, está à vontade para o fazer, uh, quem quiser fazê-lo em português, também poderá fazer, e eu... Uh, Tentarei ir traduzindo, que isso não seja um fator de inibição depois para a parte do debate. Vou só dizer duas ou três coisas muito breves. Enfim, algumas das pessoas que aqui estão hoje já estiveram ontem no Teatro Maria Matos, enfim, numa ação muito participada, em que eu também já tinha dito uma ou duas, tinha feito uma ou duas notas em torno do, do Alex e do seu trabalho, vou repeti-las, não sem antes começar por referir o enquadramento desta iniciativa. Esta iniciativa decorre no âmbito do programa coordenado pelo Centro de Estudos Sociais da Universidade de Coimbra e pelo Instituto de História Contemporânea da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, em torno do centenário da Revolução Russa, ou da Revolução de Outubro, da Revolução de 1917. Na verdade, a vinda do Alex e Yurcha que esta semana a Lisboa decorre também em parceria com o Teatro Maria Matos, no âmbito de um programa dedicado às questões da utopia e do comum, e foi essa parceria que tornou possível trazê-lo dos Estados Unidos até nós. Ontem deu a conferência no Maria Matos, hoje a conferência aqui sobre temas diferentes, como veremos. Muito brevemente, só apresentar a trajetória profissional uh, do, do Alex, é ele é licenciado em Antropologia Cultural na Duke University, para onde foi nos anos 90, no início dos anos 90, uh, nos anos 80 vivia ainda na União Soviética, uh, nos anos 90 de qualquer das formas também já não poderia viver na União Soviética, uh, mas vivia em São Petersburgo. Um, e uh, foi licenciado em Antropologia Cultural, então, para a Duke University. Hoje em dia, continua nos Estados Unidos, hoje em dia é professor em, na Universidade da Califórnia, em Berkeley. Um, e um, a sua principal obra é o livro do qual nos falou uh, um pouco ontem, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, The Last Soviet Generation, um livro publicado no início deste século pela Duke University Press, e que foi um livro que, de resto, foi o ano passado... Princeton University Press. Yes, Princeton University Press, sorry. E, e um livro que foi, um, o, o ano passado, um, também traduzido e publicado na Rússia, onde, de resto, recebeu o prémio para melhor livro de não-ficção, um, e é um trabalho que é construído sobre um período assim, histórico, entre a Rússia dos anos, a União Soviética dos anos 50 uh, ao período da queda, e também a Rússia dos anos 90, na medida em que é um trabalho sobre memórias, não apenas as memórias aqui entendidas enquanto algo que se reporta a um determinado passado, mas algo que é construído no passado em que essa recordação vai sendo produzida. O trabalho é um trabalho... Um, inserido, se quisermos disciplinarmente, esse livro no campo da antropologia. É um trabalho que interessa, porventura, também bastante a historiadores, pelo menos há alguns historiadores que, que quiseram encontrar numa nova vaga de estudos, assim podemos dizer, que emergiu nos Estados Unidos da América nos anos 80 e 90, é a fundação de um novo olhar sobre a história da União Soviética. Aquilo é que no contexto norte-americano se chamou a história, a historiografia revisionista aplicada ao período soviético. Revisionista justamente na medida em que revia o olhar tradicionalmente construído sobre a União Soviética no período da Guerra Fria, muito marcado por conceitos de interpretação-chave, como o conceito de totalitarismo, que de alguma maneira é um conceito-chave que se tornou também um chavão no debate política atual. Bom, a historiografia revisionista, muito fundada na escola uh, da Sheila Fitzpatrick em Chicago, acabou por propor um olhar sobre a União Soviética distinto, sobre o passado soviético, distinto não tanto, ou eu não sublinharia esse aspecto, não tanto distinto do ponto de vista do balanço político ou ideológico a fazer dessa experiência, mas particularmente distinto do ponto de vista disciplinar, procurando a partir da história social ou da antropologia ou do cruzamento entre ambas as áreas, no fundo olhar para o passado soviético um, 
conseguindo uh, ser sensível ou fazer sentido enfim, das diferentes agencialidades que fizeram parte desse passado, não apenas o Estado, não apenas as elites políticas, mas, no fundo, suspendendo um pouco o conceito do totalitarismo enquanto conceito interpretativo e procurando, de alguma maneira, através de chaves conceptuais diferentes, compreender o sentimento de adesão ou de simpatia ou de recusa face ao regime soviético, superando um conjunto de binarismos conceptuais, como, aliás, o Alex se referiu ontem. Bom, já falei demasiado, queria centrar-me agora muito particularmente naquilo que nos traz aqui hoje e que tem que ver com o próximo uh, livro uh, do, do Alexei, que será publicado, está em, está em fase de desenvolvimento. Na verdade, aquilo que ele hoje nos falará é, em parte, creio eu, um capítulo desse livro e é um trabalho que, que tem como título justamente... Uh, os Corpos de Lenin, um, de alguma forma já agora, esse foi o título que eu tinha dado, tem aqui um título mais específico, uh, mas no fundo a problemática será a mesma, como verão, não me vou adiantar muito uh, a, esse, a esse respeito, um, e vou-lhe passar a palavra, so, I now give you the word for the presentation, a 50 minutes presentation, and then we have time for debate, discussion, comments, critics. Uh, criticisms, I'll go there so that yeah. I can, yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you to Joseph for organizing the whole thing. Um, I gave a talk yesterday already. It's my first trip to Portugal ever, so I walked around Lisbon today. It's gorgeous, and as I expected, so I'm very excited. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, and I wanted to tell you that I probably will sit like this, okay, so I can see everyone. Otherwise, if I sit this way, <laughs> you will see my side. So, um, Jose will be operating the slides, right? Yeah. He'll be the light man. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> the talk today, um, unlike the talk yesterday, is uh, from my new project. I'm finishing a book about Soviet history. I, but I'm an anthropologist, uh, as Jose probably already mentioned. So my uh, approach, approach to history is an anthropological one, and also to, uh, it's very much bringing history into the contemporary stuff as well. And this particular project uh, focuses on the science which developed around the project of preservation of Lenin's body. Uh, it doesn't only talk about the science, it uses the science as a prism through which to think about the political history. Um, And it also brings it on, onto a global scale at some point, which I will not be speaking about today, because there are some uh, 10 bodies which were preserved around the world by the same lab in Moscow, and they all got preserved for different reasons, and they referred to different political projects, some of them communist, some not. Out of those 10 bodies, um, three remain, and also the fourth one, uh, And that's three apart from Lenin. Lenin is also so four altogether, plus the fifth one is Mao Zedong in China. The others were buried. Okay, and I can elaborate on that part of the project later if you're interested during the discussion. But now, uh, retouching the sovereign, biochemistry of perpetual Leninism. What kind of a body is lying in the mausoleum in Moscow? Is this the real body of Lenin, an artificial model, or a combination of the two? Rumors about its fake nature have circulated from the beginning of the project. In the first days after Lenin's death in January 1924, his body lay in state in the House of Unions in Moscow, where enormous crowds gathered to bid farewell to the leader. Poet uh, Vera e Ebner, standing in endless line, slowly filing past the body, was reminded of the crowds that gathered in the Panoptical Museum in St. Petersburg a few years previously to see a wax effigy of the Egyptian Empress Cleopatra. In the reenactment of Cleopatra's death, every several minutes a snake slithered out and bid her exposed breast. When Lenin's embalmed body was publicly displayed in the mausoleum in late summer 1924, Moscow was again awash with rumors that the body was not uh, real, that it was made of wax. In the atmosphere of widespread denunciations in the mid-1930s, a young woman reported to the secret police that her acquaintances, the sister and daughter of the once powerful Felix Dzerzhinsky, said in a private conversation that the body lying in the mausoleum is a wax dummy. 
These speculations were regularly repeated in Western newspapers. Uh, to dispel them, in the 1930s, the party invited a group of Western newsmen to visit the mausoleum. An American journalist, Louis Fisher, wrote uh, that Boris Barsky, one of Lenin's two original embalmers, opened the hermetically sealed uh, glass sarcophagus, tweaked Lenin's nose to the right and left. It was not wax, it was real Lenin. These rumors persisted because they seemed plausible. Why bother with the complex science of maintaining Lenin's body if creating its perfect uh, wax replica would do the trick? Besides, drawing a line between the real body and artificial replica is not always easy. Internal liquids in the cells of Eva Peron's body, for example, <clears throat> have been indeed uh, substituted with wax, prompting her embalmers to nickname her a candle. Despite the popular assumption, the body of uh, Jeremy Bentham in University College London is mostly artificial. Bentham's skeleton is real, but the flesh around his uh, skeleton is made of straw. Bentham's head is a replica too. His real head shriveled beyond recognition and is pre uh, preserved in a separate box. When Mao Zedong died in 1976, a group of Chinese medics was unexpectedly charged with the task of preserving the chairman's body. Mao wanted to be cremated originally. Having no experience in the matter and unable to turn for advice to the experienced Soviet scientists, because at that time the Sino-Soviet relations were at their worst, the Chinese had to experiment. As a backdrop, it was decided to create a wax replica of Mao's body. Beijing Institute of Arts and Crafts dispatched two specialists to Madame Tussauds Museum in London to learn the newest methods of wax modeling. With surprise and satisfaction, they telegraphed back to Beijing that in this technique, at least, China is already far more advanced than England. In 1977, both bodies of Mao, real and waxen, were transferred to the mausoleum in Tiananmen Square. Which one of them uh, is on display at a given moment depends on whether Mao's real body is scheduled to undergo maintenance. After the Soviet collapse, uh, rumors that Lenin's body is fake resurfaced and grew exponentially. Reacting to this surge, Ilya Zbarsky, son of the original embalmer and himself a long-time expert in Lenin lab, wrote, quote, I worked in the mausoleum lab for 18 years, and I know for a fact that Lenin's body is in a very good shape. It, all sorts of rumors and fabrications which claim that this is not Lenin's body but an effigy, or that, Lenin's face, or that only Lenin's face and hands are successfully preserved, have no foundation in reality, unquote. This statement didn't stop the rumors. In the late 1990s, newspapers claimed again that allegedly there were several bodies of Lenin, uh, and they called them doubles. Um, and another expert reacted to this claim. This time it was Professor Yuri Romakov, deputy director of the Lenin lab. He explained on the, in an interview on Radio Echo Moscow in 2000 that Lenin's body was still his own and required no substitutes. In 2008, Vladimir Medinsky, at that time a Duma deputy and now Russia's Minister of Culture, again announced that Lenin's body was not real, um, alluding to the fact that most of Lenin's internal organs and liquids were gone uh, during autopsy, he said, do not fool yourselves with the illusion that what is lying in the mausoleum is Lenin. What's left there is only 10% of his body, unquote. The respected political weekly of Lust responded with its own half-ironic calculation and concluded that the Duma deputy got it wrong. What's lying in the mausoleum is not 10% of Lenin's body, but 23%. <laughs> if we looked closely at the material composition of Lenin's body, we would see that such rumors are not completely unfounded. The scientists of Lenin lab have always focused on preserving the dynamic form of Lenin's body, its shape, color, weight, firmness, suppleness of its skin, flexibility of its joints. Even today, uh, the joints in Lenin's body can bend, its torso and neck can rotate, its back and thighs remain supple, its skin is firm and elastic. The hair on its chest and head is attached to the skin, and all its bodily textures are firm and flexible. However, to achieve this remarkable feat, Lenin's lab has been gradually substituting the body's original biological matter with new artificial materials. In Soviet times, special commissions of the party and scientists periodically studied Lenin's body in naked state examining spots on its surface, the suppleness of its skin, the flexibility of its joints. To this political scientific gaze of the state, Lenin's body appeared as flexible, 
evolving, sometimes improving with time. But to regular visitors in the mausoleum, the body always looked static, fixed, fixed in some distant past, preserved once and for all. Visitors saw Lenin's body lying in a glass sarcophagus, dressed in a dark suit with only his head and hands exposed. They never saw unexposed parts of the body, never heard of the condition of the scientific procedures, or the scientific procedures to which the body as a whole was subjected. The existence of these two distant, distinct regimes of visibility, two different ways of seeing the body, one for the gaze of the political leadership and the other for the gaze of the common citizens, suggests that the political role of Lenin's body always <coughs> exceeded that of, the, of a propaganda symbol designed to boost popular support for the Bolshevik project. To understand this political role, which I claim exceeds the propaganda role, we must first return to the period just before Lenin's death. In spring 1922, Lenin fell ill and exhausted, and on the encouragement of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, left Moscow for a country estate of Gorky. He rested under the supervision of doctors, but continued to lead the party and make occasional appearances in Moscow. Uh, but after he had a stroke in May 1922 and temporarily lost ability to speak, read, and write, the party leadership introduced stricter rules, isolating him from political life. The new rules reflected a real concern for Lenin's health, but were also designed to neutralize a powerful political rival. In June 1922, a secretary of the Central Committee complained in a letter to a friend that Dzerzhinsky and Smidovich, quote, guard Lenin like two bulldogs, not letting anyone come close to him or even into the building where he is staying. In the next year, Lenin's condition worsened, then improved, then worsened again. In spring 1923, after the third stroke, he almost completely lost the ability to communicate while the political rivalry in the leadership intensified. Lenin didn't simply disappear, though, from the political view, but rather his public presence now acquired a new form. While the living and ailing Lenin was isolated in the Gorky estate, a newly constructed canonized image of Lenin started to dominate the political language. Most of the mythological images and institutions around Lenin cult that became familiar to all during the Soviet history were, in fact, created in those final months of his life, and in spite of Lenin's active protestations. In early 1923, the term Leninism was introduced into public circulation, and rituals of pledging allegiance to Leninism were introduced into party practice. In March 1923, Lenin Institute was established in Moscow. Much of what Lenin was saying in writing after the fall of 1922 was actively banished from his canonized image. At the same time, the newspaper Pravda appealed to its readers to send every scrap of paper bearing an inscription or mark made by Lenin to Lenin Institute. So Lenin, the political figure, was now doubled into one Lenin that was banished from political uh, life and another Lenin that was canonized within that life. In these two simultaneous pro uh, processes, the banishment and canonization, in the early 1920s, the doctrine of Leninism was created. Every Soviet leader from Stalin to Gorbachev produced his own version of Leninism, suppressing, reintroducing, or reinterpreting difficult, different aspects of Lenin legacy. In 1990, less than two years before the Soviet state collapsed, the Communist Party admitted that all previous versions of Leninism contained distortions of Lenin's work. Writing in the Central Daily in 1990, a professor of Marxist-Leninist philosophy lamented, quote, our tragedy is that we do not know Lenin, we never read his original texts in the past, and we still do not do this today. For decades, we have perceived Lenin through mediators, interpreters, popularizers, and other distorters." <clears throat> Unquote. A historian wrote in a widely circulating daily that Khrushchev and, and Brezhnev, quote, were obviously not Leninists. For them, Lenin was only an icon behind which they could hide, Unquote. Another historian complained that even the Institute of Marxist-Leninism the country's leading authority on Lenin's theoretical legacy, quote, for 70 years since its foundation has been fulfilling an absurd function, legitimating, legitimating for, public, uh, for publication those Lenin's texts that matched the canon of the day, however different from real Lenin's words they were, and altering or modifying those Lenin's texts that didn't fit the canon, unquote. 
In his speech on the occasion of Lenin's 120th anniversary in April 1990, Gorbachev said, quote, Lenin still remains with us as the greatest thinker of the 20th century. But then he quickly added, we must rethink Lenin and his theoretical and political work, and we must rid ourselves on, of the distortions and canonizations of his conclusions. Gorbachev concluded his speech with a statement which sounded blasphemous at the time. He, he said that it's time to abandon the concept of Leninism altogether because it reduces Lenin's complex thought to a collection of canonized statements. When Lenin died in January, on January 21st, 1924, no plans to preserve his, his body existed. He wanted to be buried uh, in his family crypt in St. Petersburg. Professor Abrikosov conducted an autopsy and performed a short-term embalming that would allow Lenin's body to be displayed in an open coffin for five days during the public farewell. The, incision that, uh, the incisions that Abrikosov made in Lenin's body cut across its major <coughs> arteries and blood vessels. Later, Abrikosov admitted that had the plans to preserve Lenin's body for posterity existed at the time of the autopsy, he would not have cut these arteries and blood, blood vessels because in long-term preservation, they are used to deliver embalming liquids to all corners of the body. Lenin Lane stayed in the House of Trade Unions in Moscow with huge crowds waiting in extremely cold uh, weather to bid farewell to the leader. It was announced that Lenin would be buried on January 21st, uh, 27th, I'm sorry, 27th, in a uh, newly built mausoleum on Red Square near the tomb of fallen revolutionaries. It was very cold in Moscow that year. It was also January, like now, <clears throat> minus 20, minus 25. Due to cold temperature, the body lying in the mausoleum showed no signs of decay for the next two months, in fact. It was in this wooden uh, mausoleum. But in late March, the weather got warmer, and the first threatening signs of decomposition were noticed. The extended period during which the body remained in an open sarcophagus allowed the party leadership to discuss it and consult the scientists again and again in endless meetings. It was then that the decision that the body might be preserved and displayed for posterity gradually emerged. At first, many party leaders considered this idea counter-revolutionary. Trotsky, Bukharin, and Voroshilov, for example, argued that preserving Lenin's body would be akin to creating a religious relic, an act that violated Marxist-Leninist principles. Bojnj Brujevic stressed that while it was important to create a public memorial for Lenin, his body should be buried in a closed tomb. But others considered it important to display Lenin's body for a while longer, perhaps even indefinitely allowing more people from all over the world to pay their respects. Concluding a decisive meeting of the leadership on March 5th, 1924, Avil Yunukidze, member of the Central Ex Executive Committee, said, the body should be preserved and displayed, but without promising to anyone that this is done for posterity. If it doesn't hold up after a period of time, we will have to enclose it, unquote. In late March, it was decided to try an experimental embalming procedure proposed by Professor of Medicine Vladimir Vorobyov and biochemist Boris Barsky. <coughs> Neither of them was certain of success. Vorobyov and Zbarsky worked for four months and in late July 1924 reported to the leadership that provided Lenin's body was regularly re-embalmed according to the dynamic method that they developed, it could be preserved for quite some time. They didn't specify for how long. Following their success uh, uh, on July 9, 24th, 1924, the Commission for the Immortalization of Lenin's Memory issued the following statement. We didn't want to turn the body of Vladimir Ilyich into some kind of relic by means of which we could po popularize or preserve his memory. He had already immortalized himself enough with his brilliant teaching and revolutionary activities. We wanted to preserve the body of Vladimir Ilyich because it is of great importance to preserve the physical look, physical oblique, physical image of this uh, remarkable leader for the next generation and all the future generations." Unquote. The long debates about the fate of Lenin's body and the retrospective statement, which I, I just read, uh, about the decision to preserve it, suggest that the party leadership saw this body in two distinct ways. This duality is reminiscent of how they treated Lenin in the final months of his life when the flesh and blood Lenin was banished from political life, while the other newly constructed Lenin of Leninism 
was canonized within it. Lenin body was now treated in this dual way too. It was officially buried, but continued to be on display. It was preserved for an indefinite future, but not simply to popularize the memory of a, of a concrete individual. It was the corpse of a person, but its matter transcended individual biology. While this was the body of Lenin, it was also the embodiment of something that was different from Lenin and bigger than him. This way of treating Lenin's body in 1924 is strikingly similar to how the lab scientists have thought about their work since then and how they talk about it today. Uh, th this is the entrance to the lab. And if you go to the next one. OK. So academician Yuri Lukuhin on the right, for several decades a leading scientist of the lab, prefers to call Lenin's body life sculpture, Jovaya Scriptura. Uh, in, in my conversations with him. I hang out in their lab and with him especially a long time. The phrase life sculpture sounds contradictory, which points to a number of ambiguities associated with the body that uh, such terms as corpse, mummy, or relic don't quite capture. After decades of being re and re-sculpted, the original biological composition of Lenin's body has changed so considerably, Lobuchin tells me, that in some way it is closer to a representation of Lenin's body than the body itself. At the same time, Lobuchin stresses, this is not an external representation, as in sculpture or painting, but undeniably the actual body itself. So the phrase life sculpture is designed to capture this ambiguity, referring to a body that both is and is not a representation, as if to say that this is a sculpture of the body that is constructed out of the body itself. In fact, adds Lukuhin, the term sculpture doesn't quite satisfy him either, since it suggests a stiff and hard body, whereas Lenin's body is supple and flexible. To maintain the material form and dynamic properties of the body, continues Lukuhin, one must, quote, one must not only know the basics of anatomy, physical chemistry, or how to maintain the water balance, one must also possess an artistic sense. This is why not everyone is capable of doing this work, unquote. Professor Vladislav Kazeltsev, no, 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 go back. Vladislav uh, Kazeltsev, uh, I will wave to you, but if I point yeah. this, yeah. Vladislav Kazeltsev, another veteran scientist of the lab, makes a similar point. Quote, every new wrinkle, cavity, or protrusion in the body must be fixed. We are talking about tiny dimensions. Some amount of artificial substitutes has to be introduced, which is quite difficult. One needs to ex uh, experience an artistic sense to perform this work, unquote. On January 19, 1939, a commission of the People's Commissariat of Health for the examination of Lenin's body reported that Lenin's nose, which lost its original form when Lenin's corpse was exposed to extreme cold after death, was finally rebuilt and in very good condition. The commission also pointed out that the elasticity of eyelids has been re reconstructed and the face makes a complete impression of a sleeping person, person rather than a corpse." Unquote. But there were also problems that needed attention. Professor Nikolai Burdenka found new spots on the outer side of the left forearm and in the lower part of the body, especially in the pelvic area. Alexei Busalov, director of the medical administration of the Kremlin, remarked that on the soles and toes there are some signs of mummification. That's when the skin dries. In the pelvic area, there are hints of wrinkling and thinning of the skin. These defects needed to be fixed. One reason for the development of new, of new wrinkles, cavities, and spots on the body, on a dead body uh, th that is preserved for a long time, is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is, is the process in which solid fats uh, in tissues liquefy, and then in this liquid form, they move away from, from the original area. To solve the problem of hydrolysis, the lab developed an artificial material that had the same consistency, softness, and firmness as human fats but was chemically neutral and did not therefore liquefy in, in uh, usual home temperature. In November 1943, Zbarski, the original embalmer, explained to a party commission, after many experiments, we developed a mix of paraffin, glycerin, and carotene with a melting point of 57 degrees Celsius. This mix is in a liquefied form, can be injected under the skin, where it quickly hardens into a solid mass that can be easily shaped. From the chemical point of view, this mass is in, uh, inert and can be preserved without change." Unquote. 
The material was applied in micro-injections to the parts where depressions and change of, of volume were discovered, substituting for the fatty materials that underwent hydrolysis. Georgi Mitirov, People's Commissar of Health, asked Zbarsky during this examination, quote, so you uh, insert artificial mass. Does this mean that after a period of time, all fats in the body will be replaced with, with new artificial material? Zbarsky replied positively, and Mitirov was satisfied. From the Commission's point of view, substituting original biomatter with artificial materials was not a problem as long as it, it helped maintain the dynamic form of the body, the shape, volume, elasticity of its tissues, the flexibility of its joints, and the smoothness and firmness of its skin. So why maintaining the flexible body form was more important than preserving the body's authentic biomatter? Why did the scientists labor so hard on maintaining the dynamic parameters of this body form even in the parts that were never meant for public display. What was the political significance of this work? We may be able to answer these questions if we compare this body with the bodies of political leaders in different cultural and historical contexts. Western European kings famously analyzed by Ernst Kantarovich are a useful point of, for the beginning of this analysis. Kantarovich traced the late medieval and early modern legal theories that linked monarchic sovereignty with the king's body. Sovereign power is absolute, not only spatially within sovereign territory, within sovereign borders, something that we hear a lot about these days, but also temporally, because it has the capacity of reproducing perpetually, surviving the demise of every concrete agent of sovereignty. But in what material form is temporal perpetuity invested? When this question became important for political and theological reasons in late medieval England and France, it led to the development of a legal doctrine of the king's two bodies. With the shift towards a new secularized uh, model of monarchy between the 14th and 16th centuries, the king's legitimacy could no longer be based solely on the approval and consecration by the church, and instead became purely dynastic, legitimized purely by biological lineage, that is, coming not from grace, but from nature. Royal qualities and potencies, wrote Kantarovich, were now seen as a natural trait that dwelt directly in the king's blood, creating a royal species of man. According to this view, the physical body of the king, unlike that of regular mortals, was doubled, consisting of two bodies that coexisted within one flesh, the mortal body, or body of nature, and the immortal body, or body of grace. The king's death was the demise of his mortal body, while the immortal body survived and re-inhabited the flesh of the next king. During the interregnum, the doubling of the monarch's body acquired an explicitly material manifestation, which came to be reflected in the construction of the monarch's effigy. The effigy looked uncannily similar to the deceased, king, deceased uh, monarch, but was different from his or her external representation. While sculptures and images of the dead are common in many funeral ceremonies around the world, they usually function as representation of the dead person, that is, as a substitute for the missing corpse, like representations of, uh, in the cemetery, for example, or anywhere else in, in, in the monument. But the role played by the effigy was different. The effigy appeared only for a short period of time before and during the funeral, and always coexisting with the displayed corpse of, of the monarch, instead of substituting for it. The pair of the corpse and the effigy functioned together as the actual material doubling of the monarch's body. An effigy looked like an exact healthy version of the monarch. It was made of wax, leather, and wood. Its face was modeled on the monarch's death mask and carefully painted to look as alive as possible. Real hair was used, artificial eyelashes were inserted, Limbs were created with moving joints. It was dressed in the monarch's clothes and seated on the throne. Medics pretended to take its pulse and listen to its breath. It was served food and wine, and after meals its mouth and hands were wiped. Sometimes even courtiers mistook the effigy for the real king during the funeral procession. Uh, during the funeral procession, I'm sorry, both the monarch's corpse and the effigy were carried through the city. W with the coronation of the next monarch, the corpse of the previous monarch was buried and the effigy was destroyed or hidden. 
Now the mortal and immortal bodies of the sovereign were again reunited within one living person. For Kantarovich, the theory of the king's two bodies was an artifact of the late medieval, early modern Christian Europe. However, as many anthropologists have described uh, comparable rituals of the perpetual regeneration of sovereign power in diverse sociocultural and historical contexts. The third edition of Sir James Fraser's uh, famous The Golden Bow, a study in comparative religion, published in 1916, describes the, the ritual of royal succession of the Shuluk Kingdom of Southern Sudan, which in some detail including the rituals of doubling the royal body and using a, a wooden effigy, are reminiscent of those described by Kantarovich. Comparable cosmologies and rituals developed in other parts of the world, from East India to pre-modern Japan, from ancient imperial Rome to modern Vatican. It appears that a temporal conflict between the impermanence of the sovereign human body and permanence of the sovereign office, and an attempt to avoid a crisis of power as a result of this discordance, led to the emergence of, a comparable, of comparable cosmologies and rituals that involved bodily doubling in many diverse contexts, of course not in all. The case explored by Kantorovich, therefore, appears to be a significant but culturally and historically specific variety of a much broader phenomenon. In the Leninist system, um, a distinct political cosmology that linked a doubling of the foundational body with the sovereignty of the political regime was all, had also emerged. It's important to stress that this was not a case of direct causality. The particular structure of Leninist sovereignty developed not as a direct transformation of sovereign principles that existed in earlier Russian monarchy or in the institutions and practices of the Orthodox Church. In fact, Michael Chernyavsky, a student of Kantorovich, argued that a doctrine com comparable to that of the king's two bodies in France and England, never developed in the Russian Tsarist state. However, in the Soviet uh, Leninist polity, the perpetual dim dimension of sovereignty became manifested materially in the form that including a doubling of the foundational body. The importance of, the, of this kind of political imaginary for the Bolshevik state emerged gradually when a few contingent circumstances coincided. The relatively long public presence of the unburied body in the months after Lenin's death, the growing dissociation of Lenin from Leninism that was constructed uh, in his absence, the peculiar combination of a modern revolutionary ethos and a traditional form of power that came to define the party state after the 1920s. To clarify these points, I first uh, compare and contrast the form of power in the Bolshevik state with that in absolutist monarchies and then in, liber in modern liberal democracies. In the absolutist monarchy of European ancient regime, the uh, ancien regime, the legitimacy of the sovereign was guaranteed by his or her link to another place, as argued by Claude Lefort, a place that was external to the political world in the monarchy, where the immortal, timeless truth was anchored. The physical body of each ruling monarch in that system occupied the, that external other place. That is, the monarch existed outside of the political space of the state. In contemporary liberal democracies, as demonstrated by Claude Lefort, this uh, center of sovereign power is also anchored in another place. But now that place is empty. Democratic rulers, unlike absolutist monarchs, cannot occupy that place. But they must act in the name of that place and have to refer to it for legitimacy. For example, in the United States, the founding fathers, the the uh, Bill of Rights and so forth, which constantly, constantly referred to. Uh, it is in that other place that the foundational truth of liberal democracy is anchored. Eric Santner also uh, recently argued that in liberal democracy, with the dis disappearance of the king's body, the locus of sovereignty migrated into a new location. But unlike Lefort, Santner defines that location as a collective body of the people, the population of the nation. But taken together, Lefort's and Santner's arguments, in fact, describe the doubling of the sovereign body in modern liberal democracy. This body is split between the mortal, perpetual, perpetually re reproduced body of the population and the immortal body of the found, founding truth that is located in this other place. So in the Soviet Leninist polity, the structure of sovereign power had many features that were similar to those in an absolutist monarchy and in liberal democracy. But of course it also differed from both. Unlike an absolutist monarchy, 
no uh, acting Soviet leader after Lenin could occupy the other place where sovereign power was anchored. That place was occupied by the embodied figure of Leninism. Any Soviet leader, including Stalin at the height of his powers, had to refer to Leninism for legitimacy and could not question or transgress it. Um, and any leader could be instantly delegitimized if he were shown to violate Leninism. The emergence of Stalin's extraordinary personality cult and the collapse of that cult after his death, which did not lead to the collapse of the party, illustrate this point. Stalin's rise and fall were both connected to Leninism. At first, he was celebrated as the most faithful Leninist who had unique access to the foundational truth. And after his death, he was accused of precisely the opposite, of having distorted Leninism. Therefore, Stalin didn't and could not occupy the center of sovereign power. But what was the figure that occupied that center? Uh, political uh, philosopher Ken Joy makes a somewhat different com comparison, allowing us to push this argument further. He argues that in the Leninist system, uh, sovereign power was centered neither in the traditional charismatic leader, as for example in the Nazi state, nor in de depersonalized uh, modern bureaucracy, as in liberal democracy, but in a unique new institution that looked like a combination of the two. This new political institution was the Leninist party, which Jovit calls neo-traditional, because it emerged when two seemingly inc incompatible principles were absorbed into one organizational structure, the traditional principle of individual heroism and the modern principle of organizational impersonalism. Both Leninist and Nazi political system, argues Jovit, emphasized a heroic ethic. However, what agent each system designated as heroic was different. In the Nazi state, that heroic agent was the individual charismatic leader, the Führer. Nazi Nazism was based, as is well known, on the Führer principle, the personal charisma of the leader who claims authority because he incorporates the idea in his person. But in the Leninist system, that heroic agent was not an individual. It was the party. Its, its heroism, writes Jovet, was defined in organizational, not individual terms. The party's principle of, organizational, of organization, Jovet calls charismatic impersonalism. So the party could never be wrong. You couldn't question the party. But every single person, including every leader of the party, could be questioned. That actually eventually was questioned. Jovet's discussion helps us to clarify how the structure of Leninist sovereignty uh, worked. The center of sovereignty in this case was located neither in the body of the charismatic leader, as in absolutist monarchy or in the Nazi state, nor in the split between empty space and collective body of the population, as in liberal democracy, but in a combination of the two, in a peculiar way, in the collective, impersonal, charismatic subject known as the Leninist party. This discussion makes it clear why political role um, what political role the preserved body of Lenin played in the system, of, in that system of power. This body, or rather the form of this body, and I was arguing about the form, functioned as, as the material embodiment of a particular kind of sovereign, the charismatic, impersonal subject that was the Leninist party. As the embodiment of that sovereign, Lenin's body was doubled, functioning as a combination of a mortal body and an immortal body. This is why Lenin's body was always maintained as a combination of a corpse, Mortal body and an effigy in mortal body. The term life sculpture, if you, if you remember, life sculpture that academician Lapuhin uses to refer to this body is designed to describe precisely this internal doubling, a body that exists as a combination of mortal and immortal bodies. Indeed, Lenin's body is mortal at the level of its biological matter. This is a corpse whose biological remains decay and are gradually substituted with new artificial materials. And Lenin's body is also immortal at the level of its dynamic form. This is an effigy whose form is carefully reconstructed again and again to remain continuously the same. In all uh, periods of Soviet history, the reproducing Leninism as the foundational truth of the communist project amounted to re-editing and reinterpreting Lenin's texts, changing their meaning and reconstructing and re-embalming his body, ch changing its biomatter. Every one and a half years, Lenin's body is subjected to big procedures that last two months. All embalming liquids are drained from Lenin's body and subjected to a variety of tests to identify various biological and chemical processes that develop 
in the body. Samples of different tissues are collected and, tes and tested. The body is submerged for weeks in belts with uh, different embalming solutions. Uh, this is still the uh, effigy scan. Thank you. Hundreds of microphotographs of its surface are taken and compared with the photographs taken previously. Artificial substances are injected to reconstruct the landscape of, uh, and skin pressure of its surfaces. Plastics and other materials are applied to reconstruct the original volume of body parts, the flexibility of joints, skin color, overall weight, and so on. All this concerns not only head and hands, but also the body parts that the public can never see. In this process, the dynamic form of the body is reconstructed, while its biological composition changes more and more. This work has led, so, so far I've been make, making this political argument, but not, now more about the science. Uh, uh, this work has led to the emergence of, of a unique kind of science with its unusual uh, discoveries in, and inventions, instruments and procedures, classified dissertations and journals. All of them are closed in the archive of, the museum, of that institute and cannot be easily accessed. However, some of, in, of these innovations of that science have entered regular medicine and even found their way into Western medical practice. In the 1960s, Yuri Lopuhin, one of the academicians I showed you, and a team of lab scientists worked on a new, new method and instruments for, I'm sorry, <clears throat> new, um, new method and instruments for perfusion. Perfusion is maintaining the form and volume of tissues by flowing liquids through their capillary system. Perfusion is also used um, in regular medicine to maintain organs for, of recently deceased persons outside of the body and prepare them for organ transplantation. Several instruments designed uh, by, by Lopuhin's team uh, in Lenin lab later uh, were adapted for his work on kidney transplantation in living patients. Kazeltsev uh, and Lopuhin, both of those uh, scientists who, who I showed to you, and all of the other major scientists in the lab, they in fact are employed in regular institutes as well. So the work in the lab for them is only partial employment. They also work in other institutes. So Professor Kazeltsev explains uh, during my field work, quote, during the procedure of re-embalming, it is crucial that the anatomical image, that is volume and dynamic characteristics of tissues, is preserved absolutely intact. It is important to maintain precise volume. That's during transplantation, for example, of kidneys. To put it simply, no tissue should swell or shrink when liquids are added or drained. When Lopuhin, academician Lopuhin, worked on this challenging task, he arrived at a very interesting idea, which he later applied to his work on kidney transplantation. So he worked on Lenin's body, where the same set of uh, criteria applies as to the kidney transplantation. Or at least many criteria are the same. So he, he, applied, uh, he uh, arrived at a very interesting idea. A kidney is an uh, appropriate organ for this approach because it is relatively isolated inside the body, like a separate vessel with an input and an output of liquids. Having developed a complex set of instruments that enabled perfusion of different tissues in Lenin's body, Lobuhin later applied it to maintain the life and volume of a kidney outside the body. The first set of instruments for kidney transplantation he designed here in Lenin lab. In 1969, for this work on kidney transplantation, Lopuhin and his team were awarded the state prize of the USSR. Another important requirement for the work on the body, of Len on Le Lenin's body, is that new cuts and punctures of the skin should be avoided. Since the lab has been frequently testing the internal composition of the epidermis, this is different layers of skin, to avoid cutting the skin, it developed new non-invasive methods of testing. In 1986, Lopuhin and his colleague Adrianov at the Research Institute of Physical Chemical Medicine adapted this method for non-invasive measurements of cholesterol level in the skin of live patients. The method is known as a three-drop test. It involves putting uh, a drop of a liquid on the surface of, uh, of the palm. It enters into re reaction with the underskin cholesterol, extracting it to the surface of the skin. I'm talking about life patients. Th then a drop of another solution is applied to the same spot. This solution changes color of the presence of, of cholesterol, in the presence of cholesterol. 
In fact, not one but three drops are applied to the same, uh, at the same time, each uh, with different concentration of the solution and so forth. So basically by looking at the uh, change of color, you can quite accurately measure the number, uh, the percentage of cholesterol under the skin. Uh, and 11%, precisely 11% of human cholesterol is uh, uh, contained under the skin. So it's a pretty good uh, prediction of the general level of cholesterol in the body. The test can be conducted at home because it's non-invasive. It doesn't require any injections. Uh, but it, it, its precision increases if the color changes and so forth. So in 1992, Lopuhin and his colleague described the three-drop test in an English language publication. And in 2002, they received a US patent for, for the method. This is the US patent. The patent was purchased by a Toronto-based Canadian medical device company called Internal Medical Innovations that was later renamed Premed. Using the three-drop uh, method, together with, with another Canadian company, Miraculins, they developed a simple non-invasive diagnostic test for cholesterol known as preview test. Today it is marked, uh, go further. Today it is marketed in Canada, Europe, and the United States as the world's first and only non-invasive skin cholesterol test. You can read it there. However, its promotional materials do not mention its origin in Lenin's body. <laughs> <laughs> and now the conclusion. In her study of Lenin's cult, historian Nina Tumarkin suggested that the Bolshevik leadership preserved Lenin's body to create a sacred relic that would continue to legitimate Soviet power and mobilize the population, as she wrote, that was deeply orthodox, largely illiterate and invested in saints and relics. It has been also suggested that uh, the decision to preserve Lenin's body was influenced by Nikolai Fyodorov's philosophy of common cause that sought human salvation and the physical resurrection of the flesh. If these ideas influence the decision in any way, they could not have been decisive, however. The problem with this kind of arguments, of Tumarkin's argument especially, is that the, they focus on the symbolic analysis of Lenin's body without paying any attention to its actual material composition and scientific procedures to which it has been subjected. In fact, as I have argued, the complex method of preserving Lenin's body amounts to a continuous reconstruction of its form and substitution of its flesh to a uh, with new artificial substances. What emerges in this process is a kind of quasi-artificial flesh that is quite incompatible with the nature of incorruptible relics, as in Tomarkin's argument, or with the remains that Fyodorov sought to resurrect. To understand what the political role of Lenin's body was in the Soviet times, it is important to know its dynamic materiality, and pay attention to that science and do the fieldwork in the lab. The condition of its tissues, cells, and joints, the procedures and tests to which it has been subjected the scientific knowledge that was developed around it. Lenin's body has played a central role in reproducing Lenin's sovereign power. Sovereignty in the Leninist uh, system was vested neither in the figure of the ruler, as in the traditional absolutist monarchy, nor in the abstract population, as in modern liberal democracy, but in the collective impersonal agent, this heroic one, Leninist party. This sovereign agent transcended every one of its members. Each party member, including the party leader, including even Stalin, could be found to be wrong and illegitimate. But the party as an impersonal agent was always already legitimate and right. Lenin, Lenin's body was the material embodiment of that impersonal sovereign agent. Regularly reproducing Leninism as the foundational truth of the system involved manipulating and reinterpreting his texts and facts of his life, and also resculpting his physical body at the level of form while changing it by a structure, by a substance, I'm sorry. In the end, the persistent rumors about Lenin's body being a fake are neither quite accurate nor altogether wrong. This body is real, and yet, yet it is constructed. Its biomaterial composition is changing, but its dynamic form, form, um, form remains the same. This project emerged gradually as part of a complex political cosmology that most participants, politicians and scientists, could not necessarily articulate in all of its underlying cultural complexity. <coughs> The cultivation of Lenin's body in the Soviet period was always performed in strict secrecy, behind closed doors, visible only to the gaze of the political leadership and a small group of scientists. The reason for this secrecy is the same 
as the reason for making vi invisible constant manipulations to which Lenin's words, thoughts, and facts uh, of his life had been always subjected. This approach allowed for Leninism to appear as the eternal, unchanging foundational truth, a kind of truth that appeared to be the legitimate source of the party's actions, rather than the product of the party. With the demise of the party, the communist project, and the Soviet polity in 1991, Lenin's body became severed from this complex political and cultural system and lost its role in the system of sovereignty. The new Russian state neither closed the mausoleum nor paid much attention to it. In the past 25 years, it has deferred any decision on the fate of Lenin's body. Today, the body remains in public display and the lab continues its work. In this context, one thing has become clear. For many scientists, at least, of the lab, this project has long constituted a unique scientific experiment. It has created a body that has never been static or fixed, but has been always dynamic, changing, emerging, creating unusual scientific knowledge. The collapse of the Soviet polity did not automatically spell the end of this embodied momentum, did not turn this scientific body into a corpse, nor reduced it to an effigy. Thank you. Thank you.